Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, continuing with our class on 40 hadiths of Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, wa radhi anhu. Today we have a very, very important hadith and a very important discussion. Um, hadith number five is where we've reached. <coughs> now, we have this hadith in front of us. I, I actually have two versions of um, the PDF. This is like a PowerPoint that uh, we sometimes used. And the key concepts are already there in, in the book that you have. Um, but I also have uh, we'll read the hadith first. Um, If you see that this is the version that uh, is in the book, basically. Um, <clears throat> hadith number five. We'll read the translation here because the, the translation is not in the other PDF. And we'll just go to that. So this this is a hadith, famous hadith. An Aisha radiallahu anha qalat, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fa huwa rad. This is the Arabic. Wa fi riwayat in the Muslim, man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa rad. Translation. On, on the authority of the mother of the faithful, mother of the believers, Aisha. Translation says Abu Abdullah Aisha. <clears throat> so you should be Um Um Abdullah Aisha. That, that was the Gunya, the, the title name of Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha. So Um Abdullah Aisha radiallahu anha. She said that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the following. This is the translation. He who innovates something in this matter of ours that is not of it will have it rejected. This hadith was related by Bukhari and Muslim. Whoever innovates something, introduces something, brings something new in this matter of ours. <clears throat> this matter means this religion of ours, referring to Islam and deen, this deen of ours, this because deen is a matter, it's an affair of life. So whoever innovates something, introduces something new, brings into this matter of ours something which is not part of it, which is that is not of it, will have it rejected. The word in Arabic is fahuwa raddun. Raddun means in Arabic, will have it rejected. And in one version by Muslim, so this above is the version that's in both books, Bukhari as well as Muslim. And then in the Muslim version, there is a slight variation, which is like an addition, which states, Man amila amalan, whoever. He who does an act. So in the previous agreed upon in both books version was whoever introduces something or innovates something. Here it's he who does an act, which is kind of similar. First one is more general. You introduce it to yourself and others. And in this version is like the person is just acting himself or herself on something which we have not commanded i.e. Allah and his messenger, peace and blessings be upon him. We have not commanded, we have not issued a verdict, we have not told you to do it. Then فَهُوَ Then that thing that you've acted upon, that action that you've carried out, will be rejected. So that's the basic um, meaning of the hadith. Uh, <clears throat> so... Now going to the key concepts. See, I've just ch changed the share screen. This is the basically hadith, key concept. It's the same as in the other version, but because the translation wasn't there, the key concepts are a bit better, you know, uh, sort of displayed in a better way. This prophetic tradition is considered one of the most important traditions in Islam. That's the first point. 
Uh, I think I remember mentioning in the previous class and the class before as well, and maybe right at the, right at the beginning, the first introductory class as well, <clears throat> that Imam Nawawi, may Allah have mercy on him, he has very carefully chosen the cream of narrations and traditions and hadiths, 42. And I also mentioned why there's 42 and we call it the 40, right in the first introductory session. And the point I made was that numerous, maybe in the thousands, there are collections of 40 hadith, but why has this one become probably the most popular? Maybe not even probably, it has become the most popular throughout the world. Over the centuries, since Imam Nawawi compiled and gathered all these hadiths from the various books in the seventh century till today for the past 800 years, 700 years. This collection is very famous and it's taught and studied throughout the world. And there was two main reasons I mentioned, but one reason that I mentioned and which I want to mention again, just briefly, is the fact that he very carefully selected the absolute core of hadiths upon which you can say that, because hadiths are in the thousands. If you wanted to pick out 40, 42, the most essential ones, then you would not pick a better 42 than the ones that Imam Nawawi has picked. So they basically cover you know, the, all aspects of religion, these hadiths, and that's, that's the reason why we're studying these hadiths. And then I mentioned that from these 42 as well, there's about four or five, which many imams afterwards came and said that out of these 42, if you wanted to pick up, pick out a few, which are, which can be deemed as the summary and the core of these 42. So 42 out of the thousands. And then from the 42, the absolute core, there's about four or five. Some have said five, some have said four. And this is one of those four. Some of, many Imams have said this, that if you look at all the thousands of hadiths, if you want to pick out four, you know, absolute, you know, essential hadiths of Islam, we've already covered two, definitely one, which is the first one, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ The actions are according to intentions. And number two is the hadith Jibreel, um, the long hadith that we studied. And then number three is this one. And there's a fourth one when it appears, inshallah, and when we come to it, I, I will highlight it. So this is a very important hadith. And this hadith has a connection with the first one. The first one, which is probably like a very, very absolute, like the cream of hadiths, the first one which is actions are by the intentions. Actions are rewarded by the intentions. Actions are accepted or rewarded. The importance of sincerity, the importance of niya and uh, the importance of um, having a good intention. <clears throat> this hadith is connected to the first hadith. The first hadith is like, the hadith that most books of hadith start with that hadith. If you pick up Sahih al-Bukhari, maybe in your time, just go online and check Sahih al-Bukhari. You'll see the first hadith, actions are according to the intentions. Sahih Muslim, first hadith. Most hadith books, the major ones, they all start off with this hadith and then they start their you know, different chapters. And the reason I mentioned down there as well in the first hadith, because everyone's reminding all the great scholars of hadith, they are reminding themselves and reminding others, reminding the writer, the reader, the teacher, the student, whoever picks the book up until the Yom al Qiyamah, until the final day, final hour. That before you study, before you teach, before you read, before you write, it's really important to correct the intention that we are seeking knowledge for the sake of Allah in order to act upon it, not to boast, not to, not to, you know, so having the right intention. This is why that first hadith is really important. Now, I was saying that there's a connection between that first one and this hadith five, 
Number one, number five are connected. Why are they connected? Is because every action, every deed that we do as Muslims, every action or every deed that we do as Muslims, there's two aspects to the action. One is the internal and the other is the external. Internal, external. Like with everything else in the world, we'll say, you know, like make your external good as well as your internal good. Externally, remain clean, pure, in a good state. Adorn yourself. That's external beauty. And then there's internal beauty that have good character traits and have good qualities and good attributes and have a good heart, good soul. Sometimes you see something like you've got food which has got good packaging from outside, but inside it's, it's gone off and it's dirty and it's harmful. So it's no use. And if the inside is good, but the outside packaging, et cetera, is bad as well, then that's also people will, you know, not pick it up. So every action we do as Muslims, there's two aspects to the action. There's an ex internal part, there's external part. Like, let's take, for example, salah, prayer. There is the external of the prayer and there's the internal of the prayer. Both are really, really important. The first hadith talks about the internal. And this hadith number five is talking about the external. This is how there's a connection. This is why hadith number one and hadith number five are connected. Hadith number one is to do with the internal. So when we pray, we have to ensure our intention is correct. We're not praying to show off. We are praying for the sake of Allah. Uh, if we're giving charity, we are ensuring that our intention is not for boasting or pride or arrogance or trying to show off that we, we are very generous. Any deed, ikhlas, sincerity, internally, the mind and the heart has to have a good intention. But that's not enough, that's 50%. Then the external is also important which is that the way that action is carried out, that action has to be carried out in accordance with the teachings of Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa If either one is missing, then that deed is not considered to be a deed that is accepted by Allah. If the first part is missing, the first hadith, and the second, the second part, this hadith five, is you know, taken care of, example is, that the action is done really well. The person is praying externally really well. He's learned the fiqh properly. He performed or she performed wudu, ablution properly, offering prayer, you know, externally in accordance with how Allah and his messenger has taught us and guided us to do an action. So that the person is praying on time, praying maghrib, for example, three raka'a maghrib, uh, the way it's supposed to be prayed, reciting surah al-fatiha, doing ruku'ah, He's not like doing, his, the person is not performing salah in a wrong way. He's not making two rukus, for example. Or he's not making three sujuds or one sujud. He's making two sujuds because that's what he's been commanded or she's been commanded. Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, when you stand, you stand like this, you stand like, you know, you're going to, you bow down, you make a ruku, then you say, Sami Allah, Alim and So this guy is doing ruku. So externally, everything's in order. But internally, all the time, the guy was trying to show off. He was just trying to show off like somebody was there and he was pretending like, oh, I'm so pious and I'm praying. So the internal the part is not there because the intention is not sincere. This deed will not be accepted by Allah. And if we take it the opposite way around, that the first part is taken care of. The person who's praying is praying really like for the sake of Allah. He's very sincere. She's very sincere. She's praying with full heart with, for Allah and not to show off. But the way she's praying or he is praying is not in accordance with how Islam has taught the person to pray. For example, the person, instead of one ruku, makes two rukus, adds one more. Imagine we prayed Maghrib right now. And we, after we went, Allahu Akbar, Subhana Rabbi al Adim, Subhana Rabbi al Adim, Subhana Rabbi al Adim, Sami Allah Riman Hamid. Back to ruku, Allahu Akbar. Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim. Allah Riman Hamid. Back to Ruku. Somebody said, you know what? I just love Ruku. So you know what? I'm just going to do three Rukus. Imagine someone does five sujuds. It's 
wrong. It's sinful. If you do it deliberately, it's actually sinful. It's really, really bad. If someone did it by mistake, then fine. It's not, I mean, the salah will be invalid and you have to repeat it, but it won't be sinful because it was a mistake. Or you, or the salah, you know, if you, you have to make sujood, sahwa, etc. the rules, fiqh rules. But if someone deliberately thought, you know, I'm going to pray in a different way than the way that's taught to us, regardless of how sincere you are, so sincerity in itself is not enough. The first hadith is not enough. Sincerity is not enough. The external aspect of the deed has to be in accordance with the teachings as well. And likewise, just the external is not enough that the deed is done in accordance with the correct teachings in a correct way, but internally the mind and the heart and the focus is on something else and not Allah, then that's also not acceptable. So this is how the first and second, this fifth hadith are connected. Hadith number one is to do with the internal, the intention to be sincere, that we pray for the sake of Allah, we give in charity for the sake of Allah, we perform hajj for the sake of Allah. Like for example, somebody is going for hajj. Now the internal of it is that it's not to be called hajisab or you know, show off that, yeah, you know what, I can go for hajj. No, it's for Allah. And external is that that hajj, that pilgrimage, must be done in accordance with the way taught to us by Allah and his messenger, peace and blessings be upon him. Go in the right time, on the right dates. Imagine somebody went for Hajj tomorrow. Yeah, we are in, what month are we in? Islamically. Rabi Uthani. Rabi Uthani. Rabi al Akhar. Today is 20th Rabi Uthani, 1443. Somebody thought, you know what? Last Hajj was locked down. You know what? Let me just go and do Hajj today. So tomorrow, someone's taking a flight tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow starts the Hajj. Five days of Hajj, and on Sunday the guy's going to Mount Arafah. You know what? Amazing. This place is packed with so many people. It's so difficult Hajj time. This is me, you know, one, one man, one man Hajj, one man Arafah, one, one man Arafah, Mount Arafah. The whole, I've got the whole Arafah to myself. There's no, there's no one there. You go on the Mount Arafah, there's no one there. You're relaxing, there's no pushing, shoving, no nothing. Best Hajj you can do the next five days. Go to Mina, there'll be no tents, nobody there. It's cheap, it'll be cheap as well. And you be so sincere. This is only for Allah, nobody. That hajj will be thrown back at us because Allah says, I didn't tell you to do hajj in this way. Well, you might even do it according to the way, but I didn't tell you at this time. So externally, it's not just about how it's done. It's about when it's done, how it's done. All of that is also necessary. So this hadith five is talking about the external that whenever we do an action, it has to be done in accordance with the way taught to us. Regardless of how sincere we are, regardless of how much we do it out of love and emotion and our zeal and our you know, sort of love for Allah and his messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's fine, that's the internal part. But that does not justify doing it in a wrong way because actually, Part of that love for Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to do it according to the way Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us to. Somebody says, you know what, I, I love Allah so much. Um, you know, you, imagine you're offering Thiraka Maghrib Salah and you are really loving the prayer. And now after the third rak'ah, you have to sit down and then read your tashahud, the tahiyyat and make salam and complete your prayer. But that day you were just on a different level of spirituality. Man, some amazing level of spirituality. You said, you know what, I can't, I, I don't want to end this salah. I'm so loving, enjoying, praying for Allah. My heart is so much in the prayer. For today, Allah, I'm just going to give you one more rakah. I'm just going to pray four rakah. Now, if someone does go offer four rakah maghrib, imagine three rakah, but he's Adding one more, the whole salah is invalid. Like it's not going to be maghrib anymore. You might become nafil, but you still have to pray because if Allah said less, you have to pray less. If Allah said three, we have to pray three. Fasting ends at sunset. 
Somebody stayed hungry for 18 hours, Maghrib time in Ramadan. Allah, I love today's fast. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I feel like I want to be hungry. Today, I'm going to give you another two hours extra. So I'm going to fast. If somebody didn't eat just for some reason that they couldn't find food or something, that's different. But someone who religiously thought, and you know what, I'm going to extend my fast for another two hours. This is why, then that's wrong. This is why the hadith says that those people who break their fast on time early, they will be on khair, on goodness. La yazalun nas bi khairin ma ajjalul fitr. The, it's recommended as early as possible, as soon as sun sets. That's why we shouldn't even delay. Like some people ask this, that, you know, can we delay? We pray our maghrib and then we'll open our fast. No, it's wrong. If you're going to go offer your maghrib prayer for 10 minutes and then delay, yeah, you, you don't have to eat the full biryani and the full, you know, the, the whole unhealthy samosas and pastries and all the oily, 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 oily food. No, you don't have to do that. You can just have date and water or just a sip of water, but you have to just break it because Allah has said up to this time, you just break it at that time. This is why it's makru to delay it. Why? Because we can't add to something Allah has said till here that we can't add more. We can't make it less. Like if someone says, you know what, I'm going to make it till asa fast. That's wrong. Decreasing is wrong. In increasing is wrong. Decreasing, increasing, minusing, adding, reducing, adding. Both are wrong because we are slaves of Allah. Allah said, here, that's the point. That's it. If Allah said three rakah, reducing it to two is wrong. Extending it to four, that's wrong. Three, well, Allah said three, end of story three. So this is basically the summary of th this whole issue that in Islam, just as internally the sincerity, the love for Allah and doing it for the sake of Allah is necessary, likewise externally is also important and not doing it differently than the way taught to us by Allah and his messenger. Peace and blessings be upon him, because that is also a form of love that you do it as you've been told by your master, by your khaliq, by your creator, by your God, by your Lord, and your beloved messenger, peace and blessings be upon him. It's like servitude and, and uh, sub, it's being submissive, you know, submissive to the command of Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, just to finish off this um, fasting thing and then we'll get to this. This is just like the introduction of the subject. This is a really important topic. Um, the fasting, in fasting, Taking suhoor is highly recommended mandub and sunnah. See, if someone doesn't take the suhoor meal, fast is valid. But we are highly encouraged that fast, uh, sorry, take the suhoor meal. Why? Reason being is that imagine your fast begins at, let's say, 4 a.m. Now it's recommended, the more you delay your suhoor, the more reward we get. I can take the suhoor meal at 12 midnight. And that's it, not eat anything after that. If I start making an intention of fasting at 12 midnight, then that's sinful. That's actually adding, that's bid'ah. If I say, okay, I'm taking my suhoor at midnight and that's it for Allah, I'm starting my fast. That's extending, like I said, you can't add. I'm adding four or more hours. From 12 midnight to four o'clock, I've added four hours of fasting, which Allah didn't tell me to fast. It's sinful if I do it deliberately. But let's say if I didn't think it's a fast, I'm thinking fast starts at four, but I just can't eat at that time. I'm just going to eat now. Then it's not sinful. It's fine. Or if someone just slept through the night and couldn't eat or whatever, they're still thinking fast starts at four. My intention is to start a fast at four, but... I'm just eating right now because I might not have food later or whatever, then it's fine. There's nothing wrong, nothing sinful about it whatsoever. However, it's better. If you eat at 12, then it, or you eat at 1 a.m., 1 a.m. is better than 12. If you eat at 2, 2 a.m. eating is better than 1 a.m. If you eat at 3, 3 a.m. is better than, four, uh, than um, 2 a.m. If you eat at 3.30, that's even more better. If you, eat, if you start eating 3.30 or 3.40, 
basically you eat until the last moment, two, three minutes before, 4 a.m. is when fast starts. It is more rewarding that we eat until 3.38, 30, 3.37, uh, sorry, 3.57, 3.58. Maybe don't go to the last minute because you don't want to go overboard and over, but until the last moments, 3.58, 3.59. And to open the fast, as soon as sun sets, okay? Now the timing, when does sun set? It depends, like some the adhan in the masjid is probably based, normally what they do is they do like three minutes later. So just, it's okay, one or two, two, three minutes over just to be precautious is good. Most masajid, what they do is if you check on Google sunset, sunset might be like 8.03, but the adhan in the masjid timetable will be 8.06 or 8.05. That's fine, just wait till 8.05 because they're just trying to be sure the sun is fully gone down um, because sometimes when they say sunset, you know, because the full sun has to go down, not the beginning of the sun, the sun setting. And then when it disappears behind the horizon, that's when we can eat the full sun. You know, the whole of the round sun has to be fully behind. You know, they say in football that the whole of the ball has to go past the goal line. You know, if the ball goes even three quarters, but a tiny bit is left, that's not a goal. If you follow sports, you probably know this. That's not considered to be a goal. The whole of the ball has to go fully behind the line. The line is thick, so it has to go right below it. So the, this is what the ruling for the fasting is. The whole of the sun has to go. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that look at this from both ends. In suhoor, the more you delay, the later you eat, the better. With iftar, as soon as you, the earlier you eat, the better. Why? The wisdom behind this, which is being taught, is that it's not about staying hungry. It's not about fasting. It's not about eating. These are small things. They're important rules, but there's a bigger picture here. And the bigger picture is that we are being taught slavehood. The bigger picture here is we are not eating because Allah has told us not to eat. We are eating because Allah has told us to eat. So suhoor time, you eat right till the end. It's like, you know, it, it's like a practical implementation of servitude. That, okay, Allah, it's like you're talking to Allah. Allah, can I eat? Allah is saying, yeah, yeah, you can eat. Okay, eat, eat, eat. Can I carry on eating? Yes, yes, 350. Can I carry on eating, oh Allah? Yes, you can carry on eating. It's 357. Can I carry on eating? Yeah, yeah, eat. 358, 359, can I eat now? No, stop, okay, I'll stop now. As soon as you told me, like we're robots. And then throughout the day, 9 a.m., can I eat Allah? No, you can't eat. Zuhar time, can I eat Allah? No. 5 p.m., can I now eat, I'm hungry? No. 7, can I eat? No. 8 o'clock is Maghrib, so 8 o'clock, can I eat? Yes, eat, okay. As soon as Allah says, eat, eat. When he says eat, we eat. When he says, don't eat, we don't eat. So one of the lessons that, are, that is being taught with the fast is servitude. That when we tell you to eat, you eat, then eating is ibadah. When we tell you not to eat, then not eating is a good act. When we tell you to pray, then praying is good. When we tell you don't pray, sunrise, don't pray, then praying becomes sinful. When we say sunset, don't pray, then praying becomes sinful. The same prayer, if we don't pray when we're supposed to pray, then not praying is sinful. And when we pray when we're not supposed to pray, then praying is sinful. Fasting in Ramadan is necessary because Allah has said fast. If we don't fast, we are sinful. And fasting on Eid day, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, it's sinful. It's haram to fast. I'm sure you guys know. The two days of Eid and the three days after Eid al-Adha, it is absolutely haram, sinful, agreed upon by everybody that it's not permissible to fast. Now, somebody thinks, oh, Allah, you know, like in Ramadan, 30 days I fasted for Allah. Allah, I loved it. I was so spiritual. Tomorrow's Eid, oh, Allah, you know what? I don't need it. Eid. You know, these people, everyone can eat all the you know, morning and have all the matai, matai and all the sweets. And, you know, they can feast on their biryanis and celebrate. Oh, Allah, you know me, I'm just so much in love with you. I'm going to fast for you today as well. If somebody does that, then that is bid'ah and that is sinful. That's haram. And that's really bad. Really sinful. Because Allah says, today I have told you not to fast. So 
this is what's being taught. And this is the concept of this hadith. That the external action has to be done in accordance with Allah and his messengers, guidelines, teachings. Now this hadith is all about bid'ah. Now there's a few concepts that I need to explain. A lot of people, you know, ask these kind of questions, questions related to this topic. This is a very controversial topic. Uh, there's a lot of things attached to it. And this is why I try to tend to explain this in the most comprehensive way as possible so that all angles are covered and we have a clear picture about innovation. In Arabic, we say bid'ah. I'm sure everyone's heard the word bid'ah. Probably the most common word used, bid'ah. Brother, akhi, hayakallah, bid'ah, bid'ah, akhi. You know, you have some bid'ah busters. You know, you have ghost busters, but some people call the bid'ah busters. They want to just count down and, sorry, clamp, the, clamp down on every bid'ah that is happening on planet Earth. They take it like as their job, they work, you know, they're the, the busting bid'ah. There's actually, I think, a website called bid'ah busters. I'm not sure. I think there was in many years ago, but maybe it still is. Now, with this issue, what happens is that there's two extremes. We find two extremes of this issue. One issue, one extreme on one side is this extreme approach to bid'ah, which is translated as innovation. Where some people are so extreme and so stringent and so narrow-minded and so strict and so aggressive in their definition, in their understanding, in the application of bid'ah and innovation, that more or less everything is kind of bid'ah. There is no scope for anything else unless it is clearly, clearly explicitly mention in some verse of the Quran or some hadith exactly what you are doing. Other than that, it's a bit, that's their definition. This is the extreme on the right, where they are so strict about this hadith because the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever introduces something, brings something new into our religion and it is not from it or ma laysa alayhi amruna, which is we have not commanded. So they say we need a clear command. Give me an ayah, akhi, hayakallah, Quran and Sunnah, bro. Give me an ayah of the Quran or give me a hadith, akhi, sahih hadith. You know, it has to be authentic. As long as if it's not in hadith explicitly mentioning exactly what you are doing, then brother, this is bid'ah. And bid'ah is dalala, innovation. And every innovation takes you to hell. Now, this is a very strict kind of approach because we're not going to find explicit. There's no hadith saying, you know what? Oh, you who believe, steady with see, ya yuhalladina amanu. Study with CI, so that you may fear Allah on a Friday evening and use a laptop as well. A laptop. There's no eye of the Quran that's talking about use a laptop and you know do a online with CI. You're not going to find explicit things, but is there a bidah? It's not a bidah. So many things. So it can't be as black and white like that, it has to be explicit. Otherwise, everything, our, you know, Jumu'ah talks, you know, Friday Jumu'ah talks in the mosques, that's a bid'ah. And they, they actually say that. Some of them say that this Jumu'ah talks, pre-Jumu'ah, you know, the lecture that the Imam gives in English. Some places they give only the khutbah, but so many masajid and mosques across the UK, especially where they give the khutbah only in Arabic. And that's a different discussion. Can you have it in another language? But they have a, Bayan or a talk or a lecture in English, or, or some places they do it in Urdu as well. The Imam will give a talk, and then after that, the khutbah will start. These guys say it's bid'ah because it wasn't done. Even the, you know, like a dars in the masjid would be a bid'ah. Every Sunday or every Saturday night, there's a class taking place after Isha pray in the mosque. Uh, some, the Imam is giving a fiqh class. Fiqh books become bid'ah. Everything should be bid'ah because none of these things are explicitly mentioned. 
and they can't stick to the definitions and that's why they become they pick and choose based on what they think is not bidah because if you, they want to be absolutely strict then 99% of the things is bidah having a university islamic university having a madrasa having a dar ulum having classrooms having you know fiqh classes and aqidah classes everything's a bidah then but they don't they don't act so basically it's pick and choose that's one extreme there's an extreme on the left where some people because you know whenever there's a fight and argument and a debate and a discussion and a contention takes place then normally what happens is that it's all as a reaction so th because of this group this group the extreme on the left they will react and they will they, they were supposed to stay somewhere in the middle but because of the opposition and they want to really oppose this group on the right, they go more to the left to make a point that actually you are wrong. No, we're going to go there. And these guys, they were here strict, but then they go more this way. So these guys then on the left will go a bit more left. And then the right one goes more right. And then the left one goes, you're going more right. No, we're going more left. And they both end up on one on the North Pole and on the other on the South Pole. One, on, one in the East, one in the West. One in the east, one in the west, because they've gone to two opposite ends. Now, the extreme on the left, they there are some people who are so lenient and so um, uh, lenient and so accommodating of this issue of that, yeah, no, not everything's a bid'ah. In initially it's like, no, there's certain rules and conditions and not every, there's bid'ah is of different types, bid'ah hasana, good bid'ah, bad bid'ah, this, this. But to the, what happens is they go so extreme that more or less there's nothing bid'ah. There's nothing bid'ah. They become so accommodating to the point that they, they go so extreme in their definition, they go so lenient uh, and accommodating in their definition of bid'ah is that they actually say this, that look, as long as you're not doing something bad, sinful, haram, then there's nothing wrong with it. And you always, we always hear this from people on the left who, who do get involved in innovations, that look, you know what? Am I doing anything wrong? Is, if, if, I'm, if, if, we, if someone tells them, look, this particular thing is bid'ah, like it's introduced something in religion, it shouldn't be done. The normal understanding, the normal public, they think that, look, but what bad, what wrong have I done? Because remember, the action will always be a good action in of itself. But they will always say, look, I've, I've not committed zina, I'm not fornicating, I'm not taking drugs, I'm not taking weed, I'm not slapping someone, I'm not killing someone, I'm not murdering someone, I'm not stealing, I'm not causing havoc. I'm doing a good deed because it's always to do with Islam, something good. So their definition of bid'ah is as long as you're not committing something which is clearly sinful, as long as if someone's drinking alcohol, then yeah, that's wrong. But if you're not drinking alcohol, if you're not fornicating, you're not killing someone, you're not shooting, you're not murdering, you're not swearing, slandering, then they think it's not bid'ah. But the point is this, brothers and sisters, that this is the point that always bid'ah actions in of themselves are good, like the examples I gave. The person who's offering three rak'ah maghrib, okay, three rak'ah maghrib, this is why I use those examples. He is so focused on Allah that he thinks, you know what, oh Allah, I'm going to give you one more rak'ah and I'm going to pray for fourth rak'ah. So I'm going to do four rak'ah. Now in the fourth rak'ah, what has he done? Drank some alcohol? No. Taken some drugs? Swear? Slander? Kill? Murder? Steal? Fornicate? No. One extra raka'ah, one more surah al-Fatiha, one more surah, one more ruku', three more times subhana rabbil azim, two more sujood. He's doing two more sajdahs, like he's not doing anything bad, it's a sajda. So the actions are always good in of themselves. Otherwise, there's not even a discussion whether it's bid'ah or not. Bid'ah can't be on alcohol. That's haram. That's got nothing to do with bid'ah. Bid'ah is always, innovation is always about actions which are good in of themselves. The ex other example I gave you about fasting, the one who fasted till sunset and thought, oh Allah, you know what? I'm going to give you one more hour. What did you do one more hour? 
he actually fasted. He stayed hungry for Allah. That's actually a good thing. He didn't go and eat pork sandwich. He's doing a good thing. The one fasting on Eid day is fasting for Allah. So it's always a good action. It's a fast, it's a prayer, it's a dhikr, it's a gathering, it's tasbih, it's mawlid, it's some, you know, it's good things in of themselves. Salawat on the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, etc. But the point is that these things are good in of themselves, but has this way been prescribed? Because it's not about these actions, it's about the time. Is it the time that Allah and his messenger told us to do it? And is it the way? Is it the amount in, in, quality, in quantity, in duration, everything it has to be in accordance with what Allah and his messenger وسلم, told us? If duration as well, we can't extend it, we can't decrease it. That's the duration. And the timing as well. If the time, if Allah said fast in Ramadan, then fast in Ramadan. If he said not on Eid, then not on Eid day. So the timing has to be in accordance as well. And to fix a time, and this is the point, to fix a time for something where Allah and his messenger hasn't fixed a time. Like for example, sending salawat or reciting Quran. Yeah, reciting Quran can become a bid'ah as well. If I was reciting Quran on Friday at a given time, let's say after Asr, I'm reading um, some particular surah of the Quran. There's nothing wrong. But if I thought that to read it at this time, this particular surah is highly recommended and more rewarding to read it at this time. And it's not been mentioned in the hadith or by, by Allah and his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that this surah to be read at this time is better and more rewarding, then that becomes an innovation. But if I didn't think of that, and if I just thought it's just, I just want to read it at this time, then it's fine. So fixing a time for something for which the time has not been fixed. But anyway, we're talking, we're going to talk about all of this now, just some rules about it. So right now, I was just talking about these two extremes. So the extreme on the right is wrong as well, where you have a very strict, narrow vision and understanding of the term that everything has to be explicitly mentioned, you can't do that because 99% of the things will be innovation and nobody sticks on that. And it's not that loose as well to the point that then this hadith becomes redundant because it's so loose and no, everything's fine. As long as it's a good thing, there's no bid'ah. It's a good bid'ah. It's a good bid'ah. It's, it's, not, it's not a bad bid'ah. That's what some people, they say, like, this is a whole good bid'ah, good bid'ah, because the actions are always going to be good. So there is, in their definition, there's no such a thing as bid'ah, unless you're drinking alcohol. But that's not even to do with bid'ah. So then this hadith becomes redundant. So what's the middle balanced approach to this issue? What is the balanced approach? And this is what we're going to just quickly look at. Something's wrong with my laptop slightly. Hopefully, it should, it should be okay, inshallah. So, first of all, we look at the definition. L linguistically, introducing something new, regardless of whether it is connected to religious affairs or other worldly matters, and regardless of whether one practices it, considering it to be part of deen or otherwise. This is not that important, but there's a linguistic, Arabic language point of view, linguistic, definition of the term bid'ah. What does it mean linguistically? You see, there's a linguistic definition and there's an Islamic Sharia technical definition. And that's where people get confused. And then they say, okay, but isn't this a bid'ah? And everyone's doing it. And isn't this a bid'ah? Some things are bid'ah from a linguistic point of view, but not from a Sharia point of view. Look, linguistically, introducing something new, even in worldly matters, regardless of whether it's to do with religion, you know, I just introduced a new phone into the world. So linguistically, all of this is bid'ah. But the rules are not attached to the linguistic definition. Whether it's religious affairs or worldly matters, regardless of whether one practices it, considering to be part of deen or otherwise or whatever, so this is linguistic. But what we need to know is how does a matter become a matter? How is something deemed to be innovation, bid'ah, according to Islam, according to Sharia understand. Because when, it, when it's defined as a bid'ah according to Sharia, that's when it is problematic and that's what we need to avoid. So Islamically, 
it's three, three things. It comprises three parts. Number one, it was not done in the time of the messenger of Allah. Allah bless him and give him peace. R the rightly guided Khulafa and the very early generations despite being a need for it. So if someone does an action that was not done in the time of the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as well as the rightly guided Khulafa, the early generation is like the Sahaba time basically, because the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al-Khulafa al-Rashidin al-Mahdiyin, follow my sunnah, my way, and also follow the way of my rightly guided successors. In another hadith, it says, Iqtadu billadayni min ba'di. Ensure to follow the two, these two after me. Abu Bakr and Umar, he said. So Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, the early Sahaba, it was not done in their time. And this, despite being a need for it, there's a technical meaning for that behind it that you know, sometimes there was something that was not a requirement at that time. That's why they didn't do it. It was just not like the era. It wasn't required at that time because that thing wasn't around. It wasn't, um, uh, it, it, it wasn't prevalent. So they, therefore there was no need to do it. Like for example, you know, let's, you know, some compilation of a book, the Quran, that was compiled, you know, in the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and them. So that's fine anyway, because it was done in that time. But imagine, let's say it wasn't, it was done later. So something that wasn't required at that time, and then later it was done, then also that, that wouldn't be bid'ah. So, but the main point is number one, these are the three sort of parts to the definition of bid'ah. It was not done in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the rightly guided Khulafa and successors and the early Sahaba and the early Muslims. That's the main point. So if someone's doing a deed which was not done by them, okay, number one. Number two, someone is doing it with the intention of gaining more reward. So this, all three things have to be met. So the action was not done. And then someone's doing it now. And when doing it, this person has this intention that doing it like this in the form that I am doing it, in the manner that I am doing it in, at the time that I am doing it in, at there's more reward, like the significance attached to it. So sometimes people think that this particular method of doing it right now is more virtuous or more rewarding. Or at this particular time, on this date, on 10th of Safar or 14th of February, this random date came in my mind, 14th of February. Someone wants to do something on 14th of February, like offer a particular type of love salah. Yeah, someone says, you know what? On 14th of February, me and my husband, me and my wife, we are going to, inshallah, offer salah together in congregation. Yeah, what kind of salah? This is going to be a four rakah salah. Four rakah salah in the first rakah, surah al Fatiha, and then we're going to read. Um, some of these verses which talk about marriage, 14th of February. We created from his signs, we created for you a mate, a soul, so that you find peace and tranquility. And in the second rakah, we're going to do marry women. In the third rakah, we're going to read Surah Al Fatiha and then we're going to read. Um, uh, you know, another verse about marriage or something. And number four, fourth rakah, I'm going to talk, uh, you know, read this verse. Yeah. Now, there's no such a verse of the Quran or Hadith or anyone saying that on 14th of February there's a four rakah prayer. Okay. This was not done in the time of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the right. If someone did it, number one. And number two, if someone did it thinking 
that there's this particular way is established or thinking that this reading on this 14th day is more rewarding, is more better. This is exclusively attached to the 14th of Feb rather than the 13th of Feb or the 18th of October. They, they give more significance to the time they're doing it, the date they're doing it, or the day they're doing it, or the way they're doing it as well. These particular verses, they think this is a better way to perform four nafil then. So someone comes and says, uh, okay, I'm reading four nafil as well. Oh, brother, are you as well? Yeah, yeah. what are you reading? Oh, I'm reading Surah Fatiha, Surah Al-Ikhlas. I'm reading Surah Qul A'udhu Barab Al-Falaq, Qul A'udhu Barab al No, no, brother, today's the 14th. This way, you need to read these verses. There's more reward. That becomes bid'ah because you've added more significance to it. But if someone didn't do it without intention, it's just randomly, just thought, yeah, I'm reading. I know this is not established. I'm not saying it is established. I'm not saying that there's more reward on this. I'm not saying that if someone else, you're reading that, maybe you might get more reward, whatever. It's all flexible. Anyone can read anything, but I'm just doing it just as long as, you know, which is the third part. I'm just reading this. Can I read for a kind of fill on, on a daytime? Yeah, I can do. Okay, yes. And then the last part is it, it shouldn't go against the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah. So the third thing is you have to check whether it's not going against. So bid'ah is when it goes against the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah. So like, for example, Maghrib Salah is three rakah. That's clearly mentioned. So you shouldn't oppose something clear in Islam. Someone offers four rakah Maghrib. It wasn't done, number one, it wasn't done in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Okay, number two, the person is not even doing it with a more intention of gaining reward. It just says, look, no, I'm just reading four. But still not permissible because it is going against the teachings of the Quran. So now which tell us that Maghrib is only three. So these are the three parts of a bid'ah definition. So back to that intention, uh, that, that example. On the 14th of February, a couple, married couple, husband and wife, thought, okay, today after Dhuhr, we are going to, in our bedroom, next to our bed, we are going to offer four raka'a, nafil, optional prayer, um, nafil prayer, together in congregation, right next to the bed, and after the, go straight into the bed and, and have a nice cuddle. Um, Next to the bed, we're going to offer four rak'ah nafil prayer. In the first rak'ah, like I said, Surah Al Fatiha, these particular selected verses of the Quran. Second rak'ah, Surah Al Fatiha, then these selected verses. Third rak'ah, Surah Al Fatiha, these selected verses. Fourth rak'ah, Surah Al Fatiha, these selected verses. Okay, that's an example. Based on this, what we've just read, we have to see. If someone says, is this a bid'ah or not? So let's pass it by these three points. Number one, it was not done in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the rightly guided Khulafa. So we check, was it done by the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the companions? Is it anyway in Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawud, any, any Sahih, authentic, or Hassan, or even in a maybe slightly weak narration? Nowhere. This example that I gave is nowhere. There's no such a four Akanafil prayer recommended. So it's not, in the, it was not done. But still, it does not become bid'ah because all three things have to be met. Then you check number two. It is done with the intention of gaining more reward. So now these two, this will all depend on these two. If they are thinking that this particular form of praying salah, whether they think this form of praying salah gives them more reward or they give it more importance, or they give more importance to praying on this particular day, which is the 14th of Feb, or this particular time, which is 2 p.m., or reading those particular surahs. But if they have none of that in mind, it's, no, just random, it's okay. It's like, if they say, no, it's random, we just, just thought we'd just pray. And we're just selecting these surahs because they're, they're these chapters, uh, these verses of the Quran, because they're good verses that are about, they're about husband, wife, marriage, relationship. You know, is it, do you think you're gonna, this is a like a more significance to read it on this 14th of February? No, it's not, it's just random. There's nothing. They know clearly in their brain. Then 
it will not be a bid'ah because it's not done with the intention. This part two is missing. And number three, you check, does it go against the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah? We check, does it go? No, it doesn't. Because is four raka nafil allowed in Islam? Yes, it's allowed. Is it allowed in, during the day? Yes, it's allowed. Four raka nafil is allowed during the day. So you check, that's allowed. Is it permissible to offer, read these surahs and these chapters or these verses on the Quran? Yeah, that's allowed. It's not, it's not going against the teachings of the Quran Sunnah. 2 p.m. in the afternoon, is it allowed in Islam? Yes, it's allowed. If they were reading that same thing at sunset or sunrise, then it wouldn't be allowed because of reason number three, because it's going against the teachings of the Quran Sunnah. But reading at 2 p.m., it doesn't go against the teachings of the Quran Sunnah. So will that be a bid'ah or not? It all depends on number two and how they're looking at it. So sometimes it's a lot to do with that intention behind it as well. So this is basically an easy way to understand what is innovation, bid'ah, and what is not. Okay, now there, is, there are some, just checking how many people there are. MashaAllah, people are still here um, and haven't been bored off and run away. Okay. Now, this is the hadith, same country. Yeah, this, this hadith, there's another hadith that is um, basically uh, just emphasizing this last part, point number three. Because whoever introduces or, or inaugurates in our religion something contrary to our way. So basically, it shouldn't go against the way prescribed. We'll have it rejected. And that's why if it falls under general permissibility, then it's fine. The reprehensible and sinful innovation is the shari bid'ah, not the linguistic type. Like I said, this bid'ah innovation, which is the Islamic sharia, which is based on these three elements, that's the one that's sinful, and that's the one which is considered to be reprehensible. Now, a few more points to further explain this as more or less examples. These further points are like more explanatory points on these three elements, especially number two, because a lot boils down to number two. A lot boils down to this because it's to do with intention and it's to do with your mindset. And that's why it's sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between what is innovation, what is not. Sometimes it's like one person, for one person doing that is innovation for that person, but for another person doing the same thing is not an innovation. I know externally we we're talking about it's not to do with internal, but this aspect is there as well in here. So, because normally the point number one is quite clear. Everyone knows. Easy to check. Was it done by Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or not? That's easy to check. Okay, if, you, if it wasn't done, if it was done, then it's, you're already at the first hurdle, fine, not a bid'ah. But if it wasn't done, then you move on to step two. And then you think why you're doing it. What's your thought process? What's your mindset like? What's your intention? How are you looking at this? And this, and then if you're thinking that your mindset is everything's okay, your intention is right, you're, you're not doing it, you're not adding significance to it, you're not thinking this is you know, established, etc., then you just go and check point three. But does it actually contravene any established rules of Sharia? No, then it's okay. But this second one is very, very delicate, the second point. And that's why that requires a bit more explanation. These points are more to do with point number two, to be honest. This also includes adding extra significance or elevating the status to elevating the status of a specific act or deed from its actual position. Okay. Now, this is also a really important aspect. 
point two was, what was point two? Point two was, it is done with the intention of gaining more reward. That's when it becomes an innovation, a bid'ah, when it's done with the intention of more reward. But to explain that further, it also includes adding extra significance, adding extra significance. Something is significant, but you're adding extra significance to the significance that it holds in Islam. Or elevating the status of a specific act or deed from its actual position. For example, something is sunnah in Islam, but someone adds extra significance and elevates its status. And rather than keeping it at the level of sunnah, elevates its level and takes it to the level of an obligation. That's also bid'ah. Like for example, some people become super, super, uh, you know, like um, obsessed with certain deeds in Islam. They're good deeds, but they become super obsessed and they act and behave as though it is an absolute obligation in Islam. So for example, um, take an example, wearing the turban, for example, imama for men. Now wearing a turban, it is so enough of the messenger, peace and blessings be upon him. Some shuyukh wear it, some non shuyukh wear it as well. Sheikh Babika teaches you sometimes he wears it different times. It, it's a sunnah, it's good. Inshallah, you do it in emulation and love for the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. you get a reward. But if someone adds extra significance, now, you know, this is so important because this extra significance, this adding of extra significance and this elevating of the status, it can be very subtle. It doesn't always have to be vocal. One is very, very clear. Like someone comes and says, brother Akhi, wearing a turban and imam on your head. It's, it's an fard in Islam. You better wear it. You're going to hellfire. It's sinful if you don't wear it. Astaghfirullah, Akhi. You know, you're not wearing, you come to the masjid, you're not wearing an imamah. That's quite clear. that you, the, the guys made something which is not necessary into something necessary. But sometimes it's more subtle. It's not being vocal about it, but you have a friend, you wearing a turban and you're looking down upon you and your student, fellow students, there's a group of students who all follow a particular sheikh and they all wear turbans. And they all wear like a pink turban, for example, or, or I don't know if they can wear pink, but imagine they wear a particular type of turban. And they make it so aggressively sort of, you know, in a way that silently, the state is telling us that they are adding significance to it. There's, in Islam, there's no such a thing as, uh, in Islam, it might even be recommended. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore a white turban and wore a black one established. Uh, maybe one narration for green as well, but regardless, whether it's green or white or black, but there is so much significance attached to it that if someone goes to their mosque where there's out of 400 people, there's 399, all of them have green turbans, and you're just going to go with a white hat or maybe no hat. You're just going to be out of place. You, you are automatically, you feel uncomfortable not doing anything wrong. This is a subtle way of adding the status of something and that becomes bidah because of the way people have approached it. Because this, this so like, this is why scholars say sometimes that now leave it out once in a while, something which is not necessary. Don't make it as though that people feel compelled and obliged psychologically to do it. So elevating the status of something. This is all to do with this point two. This point two is that you're, you're doing it with the intention of gaining more reward because you're thinking that the reward of this is sunnah, but you're adding more reward to it. You're making it part of or necessary or, or looking down upon someone who does it. Considering something that is merely permissible, which is mubah in Islam, considering that to be recommended, or considering the permissible to be necessary, or something recommended, considering it to sunnah or necessary, or something sunnah as necessary. I give an example of this sunnah. So, so making something permissible as, because you have three stages, permissible, recommended, 
sunnah unnecessary for. Something necess permissible, someone makes it, takes the status above. Something is permissible and takes it to the state, to the level of recommended or the level of sunnah or the level of obligation. Something is on the, the second level, which is recommended, taking it to the level of sunnah or obligation. Something's on this third level, which is sunnah, taking it to the top level. So anything which is taken a level above or two levels above or three levels above. These are all innovations. There is a different, okay, at this point, there is a difference between continuous practice and firm insistence. Sometimes something is done continuously. Now this, this act is something maybe recommended in Islam, like the wearing of the turban. Is it permissible to continuously wear it every single day of your life? <clears throat> Technically speaking, yes. Continuous practice, doesn't make it state, you know, but firm insistence, what that means is that we look down upon someone who's not doing that, then it becomes problematic. Then that means that this, you've elevated the status. And this is why generally scholars say that, look, something which is not necessary every now and then, give it a miss. Do it differently every now and then, so people, the public, because what happens, normally most of these things start out innocently. Like everyone knows this is not necessary. Um, this is not, this is a sunnah. Or sometimes like it's not even, these are things which are directly established from sunnah. Like the amama is directly. But imagine that example I gave the four rak'ah, the husband and wife reading on 14th of Feb. Okay, they, for them, it wasn't bid'ah because they didn't do it with the intention of gaining more reward to do it on the 14th, on that particular time, uh, with those particular uh, verses of the Quran. But then they told another couple, and they told another couple, and they told another couple, and then basically there's one sheikh who's recommending it to all his murids. So all the married murids, like everyone, and the sheikh is given this special ruling for all the murids, like it becomes a cult. A lot of these you know, Sufi groups then end up becoming cults, not all of them. A lot of them. Some are very good, but some are very, very problematic. Now, this thing is not established. In itself was okay. It wasn't a bid'ah because nobody was giving it significance. But now they're doing it every year. Every year has to be done. Every the sheikh is asking, did you do that? Did you two do it? Did you two do it? Did you two? It's as though, and then after about 20 years, people actually think it's in Surah Al-Baqarah, in Surah Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Rahman, Rahim, O you who believe. Make sure on 14th of February, read four rak'ah nafil. That's how psychologically people started thinking like that. Subconsciously, people start thinking this is some major ruling in Islam that is like clear as black and white. We probably, it's probably mentioned in the first chapter of the Quran or probably in Sahih al-Bukhari. So over time, this is what happens. Because you look down upon someone who's not doing it. You give, this is adding more significance to it. And a lot of the things today, that's why they've become bid'ah. A classic example is molid. You know, a lot of people talk about molid. Okay. Now, this molid issue, I actually was going to do a video for YouTube this year and I actually did get it recorded. And then I wasn't too happy with certain things. So then it's an unedited version and we just left it. I, did, I didn't release it on YouTube. Uh, maybe I'm going to re record it maybe for next year now, because it's an old age debate that people just fight and argue about the molid. Now, a lot of people would ask about what is the issue with mode? Okay, what I explained in that, um, I did a 40 minute in this office. I actually got recorded, you know, you know, our admin guy, he did a full recording, 40 minutes recording, but I'm not releasing it on YouTube. Because um, you have to be very careful every sentence, every word we speak, because people from all different backgrounds, everyone, want, everyone has a view. I try to be as balanced about this issue, but inshallah, I'll get it recorded some of the time, but let, just, I'll give you the summary here. What, what is the issue with the Mawlid? Mawlid is the day on which the Messenger وسلم, was born. Now, the point is that there's a lot of confusion that's taken place. There's a lot of, not conf just confusion, but there's a lot of um, suspicions about other people. Like people get emotional thinking the other party is like got some hatred or some, some Something you know bad about you know the intentions and of the other parties, and that's what people fight. Um, but the, look, the point is, initially there is no Muslim, 
as long as the person is a Muslim, which is more or less anyone who's basically a sound, even a sinful Muslim. But is, there's no Muslim who does not realize the importance of the day that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 1443 years ago came into this world. Okay, that, that, that's not even a matter of debate. Nobody debates this. Oh, I'm actually sad that Allah sent the messenger. You'll be a kafir. Oh, I, I don't want to be happy. Man. I can't be happy that. Why did he come into the world? Astaghfirullah. Nobody's going to think that. Of course not. There is no bigger, there is no bigger event in the history of humanity than the day that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came into this world, the day when he came, 1443 years ago. Not today, Rabi Awal. We're talking about first that day when he was born, actually born. And then when he was given prophethood, there's another milestone and a very pinnacle of humanity. And then when he made hijrah. So there's some days, 1443 years ago, are like an absolute unique days, standout days in our history. And not just his, history of humanity. So you could say probably there is no greater day than 1443 years ago in Rabi'ul Awwal. And when was Prophet ﷺ born? Is actually, we're not even sure. The, the, the more authentic opinion is the ninth of Rabi'ul Awwal. Some scholars have said eight, some have said seven, some have said eight, some have said nine, some have said 10, some have said 11, some have said 12. Actually 12 was the day he passed away. And that's agreed upon. There's no difference of opinion. That's properly recorded because they weren't recording properly because nobody knew he was going to be a messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when he passed away, that was recorded, that this is the date. So the 12th is the day when he, of Rabi'ul Awwal, when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. Uh, as for birth, some say 12, some say 11, but the more correct is 9 and 8. And some have said some other date of Rabi'ul Awwal, and some have said even outside of Rabi'ul Awwal. So we're not really sure. But anyway, regardless, the point is, there is no two opinions about the importance and the happiness regarding it and the significance, of, of course. Okay. The question is, every year until Qiyamah, when that month arrives or when those days arrive or when that day arrives, 1443, 1444, 1445, 1446, even after 1400 years ago, on that day, so let's say 9th of Rabi'ul Awwal, that day to do something, to do an act. Is it a bid'ah or not? That's the question. Now it depends. A lot of people say molid and they mean 101 million things. If someone says that day, I'm just gonna smile. Why? I'm happy that 1443 years ago, the messenger Muhammad came into this world and because of that, I'm a Muslim, so I'm so happy. Nobody would say that's a bid'ah. Of course not. I'm just happy. It's not even, you're not even doing something. You're just happy. Yeah, if you go back to number two, that it, with the intention of gaining more reward, if someone says that, you know what, on this ninth of Rabi'ul Awal, if I smile and, you know, be, you know keep on smiling, Allah is going to give me extra reward for smiling today. And... Whoever smiles on 9th of Rabi'ul Awwal, you get 10 times more reward than smiling on 27th of Ramadan. Or more reward today than smiling on Eid day. Then, then that becomes bid'ah. Because it's not something that's clearly done in the time of the Sahaba. Nobody was saying on this day you smile and the Prophet ﷺ smile and everybody. And, you, and to add that, you get more reward. Whatever extra adding you're adding, that's not established. And then you're doing it with that thought in mind. So then, but if someone says, no, it's just me just smiling. I'm not saying you get specific reward. Someone says, if you smile on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal, you get two castles in Jannah. Where is that? There's nowhere mentioned, you get two castles. So if someone thinks like that, then it's a bit up. If someone doesn't, just happy, then it's not a bit up. Then other people do other things. We do a gathering. What are we gonna do in the gathering? This is where some people, when they say, look, we're not doing anything bad. We're not fornicating, we're not stealing. We're, we're just having a gathering, molded gathering. What happens in a molded gathering? 
قصائد نشي دبردة ما شاء الله you know see yeah we'll do we'll do one as well probably um you know who's reading the burda I don't know what's what's that group that uh, you know I've been to you know many burda gatherings I've recited burda myself you know many times um, so we're gonna have some the burda recitation and reminders and things like that and we're gonna have a gathering now is that a bid'ah or not let's pass it by this. It was not done in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Was it done or not? This specific way on this particular date wasn't done. Probably it wasn't done. Every year on the 9th or 12th of Rabi'u al-Awwal, reading the Burda, Burda wasn't even made then, reading these Qasai. So it wasn't done. But it doesn't become bid'ah just by that. That's the extreme people on the right who make everything bid'ah just on this point one. Oh, it wasn't done? Bid'ah, straight away. But like I said, that's a very extreme approach because everything would be bid'ah. So we have to get back to number two. Ah, we need to see what you guys are doing right now, this gathering of Mawlid. Are you doing it with the intention of gaining more reward? It's the million dollar question. Do you think that this gathering this salawat on the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you're sitting and say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, Sallallahu ala Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all this reading, etc. This salawat. If the people who are doing that function, that gathering, think that today's this specific way of gathering or gathering on this day, specifically in Rabi'ul Awwal or in this month, is more rewarding than you know, someone says, oh, you guys gathering. We did the same Mawlid gathering in Ramadan. Okay, it's fine. In Ramadan is fine. Today is fine. Everything's fine. There's, no, not, there's nothing extra significance attached to this month. Then it's not a bit. But if they think that doing it in this month, doing it on this day, doing it on the 12th, gives more reward and is more significance and attaching extra significance to it, they're reading salawat on the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they think that reading salawat on the 12th of Rabi'ul is more rewarding than reading on Friday, any random Friday. And that becomes bid'ah because you've added extra significance to something which doesn't hold that significance. And like I said, it can happen in, in a very subtle way. So sometimes some people are very vocal. Yes, brother, you, to be a Sunni, you have to do mawlid. You have to do mawlid. If you don't do mawlid, then that's clear vocal. You, you've made a bid'ah. But many people don't do that. They say, no, no, we're not saying nobody has to do it. But then people are doing it for years, years, years. And it's when the thought process becomes such that it becomes as though that this, this is like there'll be so many Muslims, they will actually think this is established later on. Something that carries on for years and years, years on an end. And then people, people subconsciously start believing that this is actually in the Quran or happen in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the bottom line is something which did not happen in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but you're doing it in a particular way. We have to make it clear. We have to understand. We have to realize the Shaykh, the students, everyone, the community, that this is not something that was done and there's no extra significance. And the point is that when we make that clear, so many people might not even do it. That's the point. That it has to be so clearly understood by people that, okay, if you do it, some people might say, okay, if there's no extra significance, then why should I do it on this day? Okay, don't do it. But that's the point. That's what makes it permissible. That's what makes it a non bidah because you've made it clear that this is not extra significant. This is, this is what takes it out from it being an innovation. And the last thing you check, does it go against the Quran? And so no, no, it doesn't. That's clear because you're reading what? Salawat. You're reading Qasida, you're praising the Prophet. And all of this is in line with the Quran and Sunnah. It's, it's based on the prophetic message. So that's not a problem at all. So this number two is really, really important. And you know, the point about this with uh, this molid is really these are fiqh issues, and that's not really even, you know, you can have two opinions on that. And the problem today, brothers and sisters, with the molid issue is not that this is a fiqh debate. Whether that gathering of Qasida, Nasheed, all of that, whether that's with or not. And someone might say, look, no, we're not adding significance. And 
and they might even prove it to be like even if you do add significance it could be under something okay so that's a small difference you can have two opinions not a problem but this is what i said in my video that this is a small this what i just discussed that's a small part of the debate and we don't you can even have two opinions respect to agree to disagree not a problem not an issue but there's a bigger issue that everyone knows is wrong and that's what's happening majority of the time if you go on youtube you will see in many parts of the world especially in the subcontinent in the name of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the name of maulid and milad sharif in rabiul awwal there's bangra dancing going there's weird weird dancing going there's like crazy you know it's like you're in a nightclub seriously there's things like you go on youtube all of this is happening there's people who there's people who make make it like a festival and the festival people are taking drugs and things like that all day all night long they're coming out in the name of milad lights and decorations and drums and people are do 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 and all this kind of stuff just go on youtube and they all think they're doing milad you know they have foods and salah is being missed and all day party that's what christmas became and this is why the scholars used to caution that christmas initially was just a fiqh debate should you do a, like a gathering in the church and read the bible and and you know talk about the teachings of jesus that was a fiqh debate yeah no could be permissible that's a small issue but later on down the line there'll be people who will be the greatest night clubs will you know night life and partying and alcohol will be during christmas time and this is what's happening in islam as well in maulid time the greatest party is taking place also just this this year last month i saw videos on youtube that they actually brought and there was dancing going on and then they made a stage and they there was there was a, there was a sister a woman they they put her on top of that like like a small stage this in pakistan many videos of it uh, and she was properly adorned and dressed and her hair was open and makeup and you know like she had all properly done up and you know like bangles and jewelry and all sorts sorts you know i just feel sorry but then you know the description the, the person who wrote it talked about this and they said this is the hur of jannah and and they they're basically dancing around her so there's there's drums and and they're reading qasidas they're reading sallallahu muhammad away in jannah and then this is a hur and they're looking and then they and then one person went and kissed her hand and you know a beautiful woman and this is a hur of jannah like crazy stuff even these decorations one brother was saying in pakistan that you know during 11 months of the year when i travel from my home to my workplace or when i return home from my workplace at night i have to go through like a road where you know there's some cinemas but during 12 months of the year it's dark so i don't really don't see anything you know i just drive and my car goes in rabiul awwal there's so much decoration and lights and these decorations are all over the cinemas so right now in rabiul awwal in the, that month i have to drive and all the pictures on top of the cinemas of bollywood actresses they all are illuminated Rabiul Awwal illuminates all the Bollywood stars because there's all lights and people have got all these trees and lights and greenery. So that 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 is the real problem. That shouldn't be. This is what everybody should unite. All those groups from all different backgrounds because everyone disagrees with that. The things which are clearly bad and wrong and sinful. But look, this is not the small other debate, fiqh debate. That's you know having a gathering and whether you have it or not, etc. That, that's smallish that's a fiqhish anyway we've gone quite a bit but this this uh, important this subject is very important that's why so i thought to explain the best last this point as well look it's same thing fix part of that point too fixing a particular method for general acts of worship this is again remember all these points are discussing this point too part of this point too is fixing a particular method for general acts of worship or considering it to be here the word important is fix okay highlight this word fixing a particular method for general acts of worship what does that mean 
there are some acts of worship in Islam which have been taught to us in a general way. Now, when it's taught to us in a general way, there are, let's say, 10 different forms of doing that. 10 different forms. All of them are equally okay. All of them are equally fine. Okay, all your time, subhanAllah, I keep on forgetting about that. I'm gonna finish this in two, three minutes. Um, all of them are equally um, okay. But someone fixes one particular method, one particular method, and thinks that that particular method is more important. Like for example, read the general act of worship is salat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says in the Quran, Ya yuhu ladhina amnu sallu, oh you believe send salawat on the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's general, which means it's, we've been given like a general encouragement to send blessings, whether we're at home, whether in the bedroom, whether in the office, whether in the car, whether standing, whether sitting, whether resting, whether in group, whether individually, all of it's allowed. If people kept all the forms equally allowed and equally rewarding, fine. But if someone fixes a particular that in my bedroom, on my, on sitting on my bed, is a better way than other ways, and that becomes bid'ah. And considering that particular method, someone thinks that a group one is better than individual, or individual is better than a group, then that also becomes innovation because we've fixed a particular method. Uh, and then this, this is just oh, fine. Finally, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commences his sermon with the words. We end with this. Um, I just read this. He said, Verily, the best speech is the Book of Allah, and the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the worst of affairs are the new things, and every new thing is an innovation, and every innovation is a misguidance, and every misguidance is a fire. This was the khutbah that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sermon used to start with these words. So these are just some basic points on the fiqh behind what is innovation and non innovation. And I knew that the whole lesson would go in one hadith because it's a very important hadith. Sorry, I think I've gone 10 minutes over. I, I completely forgot. I kept on thinking it's 9 30. Uh, no, 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 no. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to cut you short. Sorry, because. No, no.